Well, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for the third installment of the MCF Inspire Speaker Series. My name is Doug Lieb. I'm a senior project architect with MCF Architecture. Inspire is a monthly guest speaker series that explores the intersection between architecture, art, culture, and science, providing all of us opportunities for enrichment and engagement with a diverse group of very talented people. You know, as architects, we're challenged every day to develop solutions that have lasting impacts for our clients, our communities, and the world. And it's in this context that we're challenged with finding new ways to address head on the threats we face due to climate change and the need for our built environment to respond to those changes. Today, it is my great pleasure to introduce you to Greg Powers. Greg is the Vice President of Halliburton Global Innovation. He leads the company's efforts in developing and acquiring sustainable energy technologies from sources outside of the oil and gas industry. Greg joined Halliburton in 2010 as Vice President of Technology, where he oversaw the development of alternative energy projects and services. Uh, prior to Halliburton, Greg was Executive Vice President of Research Development and Biofuel Operations at Verenium. And previous to that, he held senior leadership positions with Carrier Corporation, General Electric, Sherwin-Williams, and DuPont. Greg holds a Bachelor of Science a Master of Science and a Doctorate of Science in Chemical Engineering from the University of Pennsylvania. So without further delay, it's my pleasure to introduce you today to Greg Powers. Greg, you want to take it away? Sure. Doug, thanks very much. Um, really appreciate it. And, and honestly, I'm thrilled to be here. Um, a little daunted in the sense that I've seen a couple of the other Inspire series, and it's uh, a little scary to follow those kinds of uh, you know, great presentations and things which are so compelling. But today I wanna to talk about energy and conservation. Um, these, this is a topic that's near and dear to my heart. Uh, it's also my vocation. So I do this for a living, but I think if I didn't do it for a living, it would probably be my avocation. So during the day, I spend my time finding and coaching startup companies who are moving the needle on cleaner, affordable energy and the circular economy, which accompanies that shift into new energy sources. You know, we all hear a lot in the press, we talk about it in social circles and about the need to get alternative energy forms in play. Um, you know, if you don't work in this field, you might think there's really not that much happening uh, but I can tell you there are thousands, maybe tens of thousands of startup companies trying to figure out the solutions that we need. Um, and the reason you don't hear about them is they don't spend any of their time telling you about what they're doing. Sometimes they operate in stealth, but they're really busy spending all their time and their money attempting to survive and bring their products successfully into the market. So the things I'm gonna to talk to you about today are generally startup topics. You may not have seen any of these things, but I'll have to tell you, I am really encouraged. And I hope you will be too, when you get a glimpse of what's happening in today's energy world. But let's start with a couple of, uh, couple of questions that I think are important questions for us to ask ourselves. And as global citizens, you know, is there enough energy? And we can talk about these other two questions grayed out right now, but this is a really conflicted answer that I can give to you for this. In, uh, in first world countries in the United States, for example, um, more or less, we have enough energy, but sometimes it's in the wrong place. Uh, California in the summer of 2020, and very similar to that, not the exact same circumstances, was Texas in February of 2021, where the energy wasn't there. And when that happens in Texas, for example, where I live, the power went out for three days for 5 million people when the temperature was five degrees Fahrenheit. And for those that know anything about Houston, our houses really aren't insulated. So lots of people's pipes froze. There was an awful lot of damage to probably millions of homes. 
So some kinds of energy, when we talk about the power goes out, that's electricity. So electricity energy, for example, doesn't store very well. You can't build up an electricity reserve for parts of your grid when it's not working. Well, at least not now. We're gonna talk about that in a second because this is a very important problem to solve. But let's look at the global picture for is there enough energy? This is a nighttime composite map by NASA satellites what the earth looks like at night. And it, what jumps out at you, and it's a stark and amazing thing, is the dark spots, the really dark blue and the even darker purple on this map. Those are places where there is no electricity. There are no lights at night. When you add up all the people in those dark zones, it's a billion people, over a billion people do not have electricity and therefore, they can't cook, they can't heat or cool their homes. They don't have light bulbs to run, to, to read at night or power to run laptops or cell phones. So this is actually a global problem of, of an enormous magnitude that I think that this community, the community that I'm in is working to try to fix this problem. So let's, let's look at a little bit, some other parts of that question. Gee, do we, do we like this kind of energy? When are we gonna get alternative energy? These are, you know, these are very, very complicated questions to answer. But let's maybe think about what do you really want from our energy systems, both now and in the future? And I think there are some things that are very easy to agree on, one is, we want a clean energy system. I'm not gonna cover it today, but there really are a lot of companies who are trying to make existing energy generation, which is largely hydrocarbon, much more clean. As in, what if we took out all the CO2 from today's energy systems? Would that be okay? You know, I can't answer that question. It's a matter of market demand and government regulations and in fact, societal mores that will be providing the answer to that question. But what else do we want from our energy systems? Affordable. You know, the newer energy, energy systems are really in their early histories of development. They haven't had a long time to reduce cost, although some have made impressive gains like solar. But in general, most people want the energy evolution to reduce costs. And that's a really big challenge compared to the incumbent hydrocarbons, since that industry has had 100 years to learn how to take out cost and be cost efficient. I really doubt very many of you on the phone or on the Zoom would really say, I just can't wait to have my electric bill go up a whole lot. You know, you might be willing to pay a little bit more or on par, but we really, those of us that are engineers and scientists in the field are trying to make sure this is equivalent cost for us. Because remember back to that nighttime map of the earth, we want those billion people in energy poverty to join us in energy abundance. So the energy systems of the world have to expand and they have to expand at a reasonable cost. You can't expect the people of Sub-Saharan Africa pay more for electricity than people in Pittsburgh or Houston where I live. And when is this going to occur? You know, this is not a moment in time. It's happening now. There are a lot of companies trying a lot of companies of, of technologies, which I'm going to show you. And it's as fast as successful companies can introduce products and consumers will buy them. The energy revolution is fundamentally different from the software revolution. Think about it. Many of us have lived through that as well. Software has relatively low capital requirements. And in today's world, you can globally scale up your software by distributing across the web. Upload and there's your software. Millions of Hardware does not scale that way. There's no app for the hydrogen economy. 
Um, and the scale up of hardware takes a lot of capital expenditure. Suppliers have to make the goods. They have to ship them, distribute them, install them, test them in place and maintain them. Those are very different activities for hardware based energy systems than they are for software systems. So again, software tends to go really fast in its introduction and maintenance. And in the hardware world, it's just a lot slower process. So we're, we're all trying to go as fast as we can, those of us that work in this, but it goes as fast as you can build things. And that's not always the pace that we would like. So do we have the kinds of energy we like? We like solar and we like wind. And uh, I think it's worth noting that how prominent are these energy modes in the United States, for example, in the US, 2% of our electricity supply is solar. 8% is wind. 8% is hydro. You might be surprised at that. 20% is nuclear energy, uh, fission, not fusion. I'll talk about that later. And the rest is hydrocarbon, gas, oil, coal, wood, and other biomasses. So to add a little more color to that issue of scale up, which directly affects when we can get newer forms of energy generation, let me talk about that infrastructure business a little bit more. I'd like to make an analogy uh, on energy infrastructure with the roads and bridges system in the United States. Let's say we wanted to have all of the roads and bridges made of some miraculous new material, unobtainium, whatever it is. Well, the road system has been in development for over a hundred years. So how fast can we obsolete the incumbent? If we're gonna use new materials, who's gonna make them? Where will we source the raw materials? And it's a phasing kind of transition. Uh, they're not terribly fast. You can't stop using our entire road system one day in favor of waiting for the new roads to be built. So that's a speed limiter. Um, cost is another thing. Cost does matter to put a finer point on some of the cost issues I just mentioned. The hydrocarbon industry has had that 100 years to make their products very cost efficient. But let's look at one new possibility for, for a, either energy storage or for mobility, an energy source for cars using hydrogen. There's a lot of talk about hydrogen these days. Did you know that hydrogen is not naturally occurring? So there's no hydrogen to harvest anywhere. There is no consumer hydrogen market today. And estimates show that hydrogen powered fuel cell electric cars will probably cost at least four times and maybe as much as 12 times more to run compared to an internal combustion engine car. Can everyone afford to pay 12 times more for their daily commute as they pay now with their internal combustion engine? Probably not. So for sure, we know hydrogen costs will come down as the volume goes up, but hydrogen as a transport fuel for cars is 100 years behind the gasoline industry in its cost reduction efforts. It's, we, we can make up for a lot of that, but it's 100 year head start that we're trying to overcome. And then there's one more thing about these two particular modalities, wind and solar that I show here. As we electrify more things, something we really never had to worry about with hydrocarbons becomes a really important problem to solve. How do we store electricity? We do have batteries now with lithium ion batteries in favor. And so we all know what lithium ion batteries are. Uh, lithium is this beautiful shiny gray metal and batteries are, are everywhere. So, uh, but we do need to be mindful that as solar doesn't work at night, wind sort of happens whenever, to operate on more and more electricity based energy, we're gonna have to store more energy during the day in the case of solar in favor of being able to use it at the highest usage periods at night. So you can build a lot more energy storage, um, but I'm talking about building energy storage on the scale of at least a home or a community and maybe up to and including 
large urban environments, large cities, not uh, batteries for cars or laptops. The market, the market is really hungry for this. So a lot of people are talking about how do we store this amount of energy, but it's not a very well developed market. The current amount of grid energy that's stored in batteries rounds off to zero. It's actually 0.006%. So I'm a scientist, you'll find that out in a little bit later in the talk, but um, it's worth noting, it's just such a nascent industry. So another thing about lithium batteries, which, which is really not become a big problem because people don't use them that much for storing large amounts of energy, but lithium ion batteries run at peak production only for about four hours. So uh, if you really needed to run your house for a day or two days, I was out of electricity for three days, I need an awful lot of lithium ion batteries. And something that many people don't know, do you know the origins of lithium? Well, lithium is in China, Chile, Australia, and a few other minor places. It's mined in open pit mines, as you see there on the left, and in what people euphemistically call ponds. Um, more batteries means more open pit mines and lithium ponds. I mean, this is an environmental catastrophe on a grand scale. Those lithium lakes in Chile that you see in that lower right picture are hundreds of miles by hundreds of miles in extent. That land can never be used again for anything because lithium is toxic to growing plants, especially at that kind of concentration. And we all know that open pit mines very seldom get filled back in and filled up with you know, fruit tree groves, right? That open pit mine is gonna be an environmental eyesore uh, forever. So this begs a really important question. Shouldn't we be recycling the lithium batteries we're using now? And you know, there really isn't very much lithium recycling going on at the moment. It tends to end up in landfills. So that's the bad news. But the good news is this is a very exciting, competitive, and growing field right now. In fact, if you look at some headlines, they're defining the issue. This is a well-known issue. These are from uh, respected journals this year, the IEEE Spectrum. So this is the American Society of Electrical Engineers. We, we have to crack the battery recycling problem. It's starting to take off, but when we start to move to more electric vehicles, the demand for lithium is going to go up proportionately to how many vehicles we have. Remember, electric vehicles are only a couple of percent of the vehicles in the United States. So if you want to change out all, whatever it is, 200 million vehicles in the United States, it's a lot of lithium. So it's going to be a problem to, to mine it. So all I can say is help is on the way. Um, this is a sampling of the companies that are working to solve that very problem. Normally, metals like lithium are recycled by smelting. Smelting is a really euphemistic word for we melt everything and burn off all the things that burn and collect the molten metals. It uses hydrocarbons or a lot of electricity to create that heat. It generates exhaust fumes which have to be scrubbed of their toxic content to get back to usable metals. And these factories are big. The batteries in smelting plants have to be brought to the factory. It's another hidden energy cost. So these four are early stage. The two at the bottom are a little further along. The top two are early stage lithium recycling startups and they're doing something really great. They're doing chemical recycling. So they're dissolving the batteries and acids, which sounds a little harsh, but those acids are recycled into the process. So they're not really used and tossed away. And the uh, company in the upper left, Momentum Technologies, is using a process developed at Oak Ridge National Labs that uses polymeric membranes to extract very clean cuts of the metals in each of the streams from essentially dissolved batteries. 
this process is a really great process in the sense that it's it's a lower energy process than smelting. It has much less total effluent and it's modular. It can be taken to the batteries instead of having to bring the batteries to the source. So you can make smaller versions of this, take it to the places where batteries are collected and recycled where they're ground up and um, collect all the lithium sort of locally. This is a concept I think we all should be hoping that companies such as these are successful and will lead to much more lithium recycling. We as consumers really should hope that the batteries that we use up will show up as the future batteries that we buy. So I'm gonna switch gears now from storage and uh, from lithium anyway, and talk about making energy in ways that perhaps you haven't thought of. Um, and I mean, methods which are not solar or wind or hydrocarbon based. There are an awful lot of ways to make energy. I just wanna mention a few of them. And I have a little theme here and it's the linkage to water. So imagine if you could use water, the power of waves. We all know the incredible, unimaginable amount of energy that's dissipated in waves as they break. But in open ocean, in deeper water, waves actually do something a little bit different. They produce fluctuations in pressure at the bottom of the ocean. When a wave peak goes over a fixed spot in the ocean, the water over top of that spot for a brief time is deeper. And thus the pressure at the bottom is actually higher. When the trough after a wave comes along, that pressure goes down. And there are devices, a lot of companies are trying to figure out how to take advantage of this cycling of the pressure in the ocean. So devices like this, by a well-known company, there are a lot of smaller companies trying this, um, use, there are many, many configurations to try to use the changes in pressure to actuate a buoyant part, which either moves a gearworks, pulls on a tether, operates a piston. And those methods on paper appear uh, easy to transform wave energy into electricity. These, enter these devices are in many stages of development with a lot of companies, some of them very, very small, but nobody's commercialized this yet, really. It's still too expensive and it's driven, that expense is driven largely by the kind of robustness which has to be built in uh, to survive an ocean environment. Just imagine the things that happen when you put an unattended device out in the ocean, algae and fish and barnacles and the kinds of things that grow onto mechanical devices tend to interfere with them. And just as a fun little comment here, this one here by AWS, um, it's a bobber and a pulley system. Um, hope the engineers figured out how to get that big yellow thing out through the door of that factory on the right behind the big yellow thing. Um, probably not gonna fit. I would have thought about that a little sooner. Anyway, um, just kidding, you know, it's, uh, that's what happens on oceanic scale. Here's another way we can use water. We all know about this. And again, uh, about 8% of US energy is supplied by hydro. This is a picture of the Hoover Dam. It's an excellent way, time-tested way to make electricity. But a couple things are impediments to building more dams. And that is, first of all, most of the good spots are pretty much used up. And projects like this one are expensive. They take decades to install. And even in today's world, nobody wants the Hoover Dam in their backyard, especially the communities that live upstream of the dam because they're gonna to have to relocate as they flood out. These dams cause water to rise uh, for hundreds of miles. And so it's a really tough political uh, lift to get a dam put into place. Here's another way we can use water in the form of hydrogen, um, it's an analogy. I'll get to the water part here. This is a model of a fuel cell. It's just an artist's rendering. 
And I'm so sorry, but I did used to be a professor. Doug, Doug forgot to say I was a professor at one time. So I would be remiss if I did not give you an equation which takes you back to either an excruciating time in high school or college or something you really liked. This is a simple one. Hopefully it's not too hard for you. A fuel cell works this way. Take a hydrogen stream. We'll talk about where that comes from. Plus some oxygen. You put it into the fuel cell through a catalytic membrane. It makes water and energy in the form of electrons and a little bit of heat. This is a great idea. Lots of people are working on this, lots of people. But remember what I said, there isn't really that much hydrogen around in the consumer market because hydrogen, hydrogen does not occur naturally in nature. So it has to be made. The way hydrogen's made today is from hydrocarbons, something called steam methane reforming. 99% of all hydrogen today is made this way. And that hydrogen is largely used for the ammonia manufacture, which goes into fertilizers and for plastics and other chemicals, including pharmaceuticals. Now, how else can we get hydrogen? Well, if you look at this chemical reaction, I cheated, I drew the, drew, drew, drew the arrow as a uh, one direction so that hydrogen can only go to water. It's not true. You can run this reaction backwards. So it's starting with water, but you have to add a lot of energy. Uh, that process is called electrolysis. And it can be coupled up nicely to the excess electricity you can generate in the daytime from solar and wind. So in a sense, it's a kind of, making hydrogen is a kind of a battery, can act like a kind of a battery. Right, so we'll couple the use of water to make hydrogen. So somewhere else or at another time, we can make electricity with the hydrogen. But for the architects in the room, Here's something you really need to put into your thinking cap and imagine this. This is the planned embodiment of that very concept of a fuel cell. Um, I took the logo of the company off. I didn't have permission from them to use it. This is from their website, but um, so it's a public domain document, but I didn't, I didn't want to use their logo without their permission. But nonetheless, this is a five and they have a 10 kilowatt design for a fuel cell. And the dimensions of this device are four inches by eight inches by one inch. So for you architects, imagine if you had a gas line, a hydrogen or a natural gas, fuel cells work on natural gas too, coming into a building, a home, commercial, residence, hospital, um, and a typical residence running on five kilowatts can get this energy source in a small space, something a little bit bigger than a shoebox, probably when you add in controls and valves and pipes and things like that. But this could eliminate running wires to houses. And if you stopped making electricity at utilities and you always made all your electricity at your home, the utilities could spend their energy making hydrogen, and not electricity. So there's some circular merit in doing this. And it's a really fantastic goal for us to think about the power supply for your house fitting in a shoebox. Here's another take on water. Uh, it's a little more tenuous, but I'll get to it. This is fusion. I want to talk about fusion. This is the way the sun makes light and heat. And I'm going to give you another chemistry equation, I guess, simply because I was feeling very professorial when I made this talk. So the fusion chemistry is really well known. The physics and chemistry of this are really well known. You take a deuterium, I'll explain what that is in a second. You react it with a tritium, the T in the panel on the lower left, and they fuse to make a helium atom, an extra neutron, and a lot of energy. So uh, what's a deuterium? A deuterium is actually a naturally occurring element in water. It's a hydrogen that somehow attached itself to one extra neutron. Tritium is a hydrogen that has two extra neutrons. So you make tritium by adding a neutron to a deuterium. 
So this chemistry is well known, the physics is well known, it works. Um, we can make tritium because we'll have deuterium from water. That spare neutron can go to the making of another tritium. Um, why haven't we done this? Because it looks perfect. Um, the problem is the temperature of a fusion reactor tends to be around 15 million degrees Fahrenheit. So that's a bit of a problem. The pressure is a couple of atmospheres. So engineers and scientists have been working on solving this problem for half a century to figure out how to hold a chemical reaction that runs at 15 million degrees. Generally, what they do is to try to hold it inside of a very powerful magnetic field. But the commercialization challenges, including cost and uh, just the real estate that it takes to build one of these, just hasn't been commercialized yet. And people have been working on this continuously uh, for about 50 years. Look, I personally hope that we can do fusion because if you can make as much energy as this makes a nuclear reactor, remember the energy that's generated here is, is per Einstein's equation equals MC squared. So it's a lot of energy given off and that amount of energy could obviate the need for a huge number of other ways to make energy, electric, electrical energy anyway, uh, around the planet. It's a fantastic promise, but a really difficult challenge. So let me switch gears now. So we've talked about making energy. I wanna talk about storing energy a little bit. You all know how we store energy today. Um, at your house, it's in a gas can. At refineries, it's in very large tanks. And we do this, it's relatively easy. We know how to do it. Energy hydrocarbons are energy dense. They tend to be actually more stable than you actually think. And so we've learned how to handle them really well. You do it without thought using it at your house. Um, so the world's infrastructure has been built around these storage methods for energy. Remember I said, the amount of energy that's stored electrically in the United States is zero, but the amount of energy that's stored in these kinds of liquids in what's called the Strategic Petroleum Reserve in the United States is 40 days worth. So there's 40 days worth of the entire United States energy supply stored in these liquids by the US government. But as we start to add more and more intermittent energy, we are going to need more storage on a grand scale. And that intermittent energy like solar and wind isn't liquids, it's, elect it's electrons. So we talked about some of the challenges with lithium as a storage mechanism. Let's look at some other promising ways to store large amounts of energy. So let's think about, suppose heat was our storage. Well, we can store heat. If we have some extra electrons during the day from solar and wind, we can make heat resistively. That's the source in this diagram. And basically heat air to flow over a bed of solid material, which absorbs the heat. When all the solids are hot, it's fully charged. And to discharge it, we reverse the direction of the air, take cold air into the hot bed, heat the air, and at the exit, the hot air can be used to drive a turbine to make electrons. There are a handful of small demonstrations of this concept. It looks really promising. And um, it actually has a really benign environmental footprint. So this is one of the things that we should all be hoping gets developed as we start to move to more intermittent energy. Here's another one, <laughs> back to water. Um, we can store pressure energy by using the extra daytime energy to pump water underground to create what this company calls a lens. It's really an underground pond. And creating that pond actually lifts the ground up just a little bit. So you create enough pressure by pumping water underground to lift up the ground um, just a little bit, maybe a quarter of an inch, but it might be over a mile or two miles in diameter. To get the energy back, we can let the pressure of the ground above this pond of water push the water down 
and back out through the pipe that we pushed it down underground with and spin a turbine and make electricity. Uh, this is a very interesting concept. Nobody has done this yet. The company that's trying to do this, uh, if you saw Bill Gates on 20 minutes or 60 minutes um, in his 20 minutes section talking about this very company called QuidNet, he was joking that he didn't really understand it, but his experts said it holds promise. Indeed, I think it does. Uh, this company, QuidNet, is the first company that's attempting to pilot this method which has the potential to hold grid scale amounts of energy at any one time, which can have a duration of weeks and maybe even months. So think about uh, Houston was out of power for three days last winter. Um, would have been great if we had one Houston's worth of energy for three days stored by QuidNet. Could have kept the lights on and the houses warm. Anyway, um, Another method, the last one about storage, is a depiction of a, of a schematic and a photograph of a pilot of something called a flow battery. It actually operates on the same principle as other batteries, but these are electrolytes. Batteries have electrolytes in, it, in them. Some of the electrolytes have a positive charge, some have a negative charge, but in a flow battery, the electrolytes can be charged up over and over again. What you do is you use extra electricity to cause a reaction which makes one side of that yellow membrane in the middle positively charged aqueous ions and the other side negatively charged. So you've separated electrical charge into ions which you can put into separate tanks so they don't react with each other. Running it backwards enables us to even out the charges and transfer the electrons back, which creates, creates a current releasing electrons. Flow batteries has some really great pluses, like really low running expenses, extremely long lifetimes. They are, however, very costly from, from a capital perspective. And startups are trying to figure out how to reduce those costs. And uh, even though they are technically batteries, one of these at grid scale takes up a whole bunch of football fields worth of real estate. So these are batteries um, writ large. Change gears again, I'd like to talk a little bit about conservation. And this is just part of the, part of the problem that comes along with the energy systems we've had and the materials systems we've had for the last couple of hundred years. And here, there are two models to an economy uh, using materials. One is a linear economy. You see here in the gray on the left, and that's a process by which you take raw materials, make them into things that people use, use them and throw them out. A circular economy is taking in a bit of material, making it into something that people can use, get it to them, use it, uh, recycle it, collect it, recycle it, and make it into something else again. Now, so not every process is 100% efficient. So you may have to have a little bit of makeup raw material, but it's very different from throwing everything out after you've used it one time. And it's probably much, much less energy involved in using things over. So the goal is how many times can we use the things that are in our daily lives, plastic bottles, lithium batteries. And, uh, but just for reference, to me, this is what the linear economy looks like. And this should not be acceptable to anybody. And the circular economy starts to look like this. And the reason I don't have very many good examples is this is a nascent industry. We've always talked about recycling plastics. And on the top, you can imagine, taking bales of plastic on the left and making you know, new soda bottles, water bottles uh, out of the same materials that you had. That's mechanical, uh, called me mechanical uh, re you know, reuse and conservation. Um, that's relatively easy to do. It's just hard to collect all the materials. Uh, in the middle, there's a new method coming out, a couple companies working on pyrolyzing 
which is burning without oxygen, or oxidizing, which is burning with oxygen, all the molecules to make energy and heat. The beauty of a process like this is it just doesn't burn on plastics. It can burn on paper. It can burn on sludge, farm wastes, um, farm residue, uh, even municipal utility sludge. So we can take things that we don't like and we spend a lot of time treating them and make them into energy and heat. And the bottom view is something that's brand new. It's just beginning to emerge. It's not really even in the market. There's one company I'll talk about that's in the market now leading the, the league in this idea of let's make new molecules, building blocks for chemicals, paints, pharmaceuticals, fabrics, fibers, the things that we use. And this bottom example of making new molecules from old waste is, is really catching on right now. Um, fellow named Walter Isaacson, who wrote a book called The Code Breakers about a woman called named Jennifer Dudna is the inventor of PCR. So if you've had a COVID test, um, her technology went into your COVID test. But it's more about how synthetic biology can move the needle in energy and not just in things like medicine. There's a fantastic company up near Chicago called Lanzatech which is taking CO2, which is a waste product as well, and making two things out of it that they've, they've publicized. One is uh, high-end molecules that go into the formulation of cosmetics for L'Oreal. And they just recently announced that they're making uh, expensive molecules that go into making the polymers that go into uh, yoga pants by Lulu Lemon. So, people can, are figuring out how we can use waste products to recycle in a very novel way to create fantastic entities. And lastly, I wanna to talk to you about, this is especially for the architects, uh, a complete reimagination of how we can think of energy conservation. And here I wanna show you just a series of still shots from a movie that you can go download on the internet. And this is a shot of two styrofoam panels. The one, the purple one on the right is uncoated. The white one on the left is that same purple panel or same kind of material uh, with a special coating on it that's four millimeters thick. And this is the beginning of the film, it's eight seconds in, and there's a flame being put on both of these things simultaneously at a little over 2000 degrees Fahrenheit. And the expected occurs with the purple panel. In 12 seconds, this thing's fully on fire from the flame. You can't really see the flame in the picture, sorry. The one that's coated is just sort of sitting there uh, there's a little blackness showing up. I'll tell you what that is in a second. At um, 18 seconds, styrofoam's gone where the flame is. And the other panel is still just getting a little black, brown-ish. And you can watch this whole film. It's a minute and a half long. At a minute and nine, um, the panel on the left shows a little flame, but I can tell you what that is. That's the flame from the torch uh, lapping around the edges of the coating on that styrofoam panel, catching the back of it on fire from the flame lapping around. So this coating is um, a, a, an inorganic material that's been formulated by a miraculous company called Nanotech, shown in this logo. And they've figured out how to make four millimeters of this coating roughly equal to R37. So for the architects in the office, you'll have to take a ticket because I'm in line uh, to get my new house insulated this way, but this could change the whole game. So it's not just a fantastic insulator, but it, it's an infrared reflector. So it's also a fireproofing coating. So um, I did wanna leave enough time for us to have some questions just to close out saying, there's a huge amount of things going on. My imagination isn't even big enough to figure out all the things that we can and should do, but
but there are tens of thousands of people out there right now inventing the things that are going to impact our future. And you're going to see those things in products over the next couple of years and hopefully as soon as possible that are going to greatly enhance the quality of our lives, the quality of our environment, and help spread energy abundance around the world. So with that, I think I'll uh, stop my prepared remarks and be happy. Um, uh, Melissa, if you have some questions that people have been, if, if they'd like to ask or um, I'll take my sharing off. Okay, yeah, we, um, we have a question here. Uh, can fusion eliminate our energy problem in a global sense? Yeah, sure. I, I mean, it can if if um, if we can overcome these tremendous challenges. There's there's plenty enough deuterium to run fusion for a very very long time, and fusion just makes so much energy that it's it's kind of inestimable. But um, you know, it's very different from fission uh, in that it's just much much harder to make a fusion reactor. Look, my hope is that in my lifetime, I'd love to see the first fusion reactor put into service because that will be the beginning of the end of burning things to make electricity. Not the beginning, but I mean, certainly a very rapid accelerant um, in the process of eliminating uh, burning things to make electricity. It, fusion will not make the materials that we need. So it's not a carbon source, right? So hydrocarbons are still used for carbon sources. Maybe that switches over to biological sources or we use all the waste we can to repurpose molecules. But um, fusion is just an energy solution, but I surely hope um, I, I get to see it. Okay, we have, um, we have some follow-up questions on, along this topic. Um, what about safe, safer, smaller, less expensive modular fission? Is it, is it dangerous? Like, what's the difference between fusion and fission? So there's two questions in there. Okay, let's start with the second question. Uh, fission, uh, well, it's only as dangerous as, you know, we've had a couple of very prominent global events with fission reactors at Three Mile Island, Island in Chernobyl and Fukushima for different reasons. They had failure modes. Um, and and I, I, I think that people you know, we can engineer solutions to those problems. And I think the thing about fission is it still produces a, a waste stream that has to be buried because there are radioactive materials that stay uh, radioactive and really shouldn't be around humans for tens to hundreds of thousands of years. And so we have places where we put those wastes right now in the United States. Um, some countries, uh, like France used something called a breeder reactor, and they actually don't create nearly as much waste as the U.S. fission reactors, which are so-called Westinghouse style, where you actually create all these products that have to be buried. Um, but there is a new generation, and I think it's a fair question, there is a new generation of companies that are trying to make fission reactors much more uh, compact, uh, cheaper, faster, easier to site, and still maintain the safety qualities of nuclear reaction. Um, remember, don't forget, people think there is no nuclear energy in the United States. In France, it's 70% of their entire electricity supply. In the United States, it's 20% of our electric supply. So um, yeah, in the interim, I think fission reactors, the smaller fission reactors, um, well-placed could be really a nice asset for us to have. Wow. Um so here's, here's a question on a different topic. What are your thoughts on solar energy? Would it be viable in a place like Pittsburgh or does it only work with places with more reliable sun? <laughs> well, it'll work in Pittsburgh when the sun comes out. Um, it works a little bit in, in, in cloudy days, um, but <laughs> fundamentally um, it's better in in, in uh, more sunny and, and arid areas, but uh, the, the energy supply, now, when you think about it for your home, uh, I think that siting decision and the, and the viability of the economics 
is definitely um, dependent upon your um, your your uh, latitude your latitude, and and um, uh, but the on a, on a grid scale basis, making electricity doesn't have to be where you use it, because electricity transports so very quickly. So um, I think in in Pittsburgh and northern climates and places where it rains all the time, like Seattle, places like that, it's really a tough, it's a tough economic challenge. You can put it in, um, but it may not pay itself back in nearly the time period that it would in Phoenix, Arizona. Um, another question, um, how, how big are the flow batteries that, that you shared with us, or how, how small, how big? Yeah, the one, the one that I showed in that picture is a very tiny, sort of just a demonstration plant. The ones that I've, that the people are, there's a couple of companies, I can't remember the name of the a couple of startup companies that are trying to uh, build full scale versions of that, that, that actually can store uh, grid scale, meaning a gigawatt of energy uh, in, in one site. And those things tend to be, you know, let's just say five to 10 acres. So it's it's not that big, um, but it's but as a battery, it's pretty big. Uh, I, I think there's really good promise for that because there's really nothing that degrades very much. They use vanadium in those batteries, and that vanadium is is very is is useful for a really long time. I don't think it's like you have to recharge it with new vanadium all the time. And you know, lithium batteries just wear out and the lithium stops diffusing. So you throw them in a landfill. Uh, that will not be true with flow batteries. So they're, I think they're going to be big, but if they're going to be grid scale, think about, well, wherever your local utility is, um, that's generally taking up a lot of space. Maybe there's room enough to put a grid scale flow battery as well. There's a lot of open space in the United States where I think we can put these things. Again, the storage doesn't have to be where the generation is. Here's a, here's a good question. Um, what's happening with the use of thorium reactors and are they a viable replacement to traditional nuclear energy production? Did you say thorium? Yeah. Yeah, I, you know, I don't really know the answer to that question. I'm not, I'm not sure. I haven't really spent a lot of time thinking about nuclear. And I'll tell you, you know, it's not because I'm not interested in it, but I, I work with startup companies. Um, to build a nuclear reactor takes, you know, billions of dollars, and generally that's not being done by startup companies. So the companies that are doing fusion for startup are still requiring hundreds of millions of dollars to build their demonstration plants, and um, so it's it's it it doesn't have the feel of startup companies for me, um, and it's not that it's not interesting. I just I haven't spent a lot of time. Um, working on it because my objective function with startups is to find great startups and try to coach them into their next level of scale. So anyway, that, you know, sorry to say, that's just one of those topics I haven't spent a lot of time on. Yeah, um, just on, on that topic of you working with startups, could you give us just a little bit of an understanding as to, you know, how you find um, some of these folks and what that process looks like? Um, I'm particularly interested in it. I find it just to be tremendous that that's, that's part of your, you know, your mission with Halliburton Lab. Yeah, that's uh, probably one of the trickier things that, 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 that I, that it's not, it's not that anybody can't do it. I think almost anybody can do it. It's, it's a lot of manual labor. So we have a couple of search engines, which are databases of startup companies. Uh, for example, one of the databases I have used uh, over the last year has 3 million startup companies in it. So if you're looking for the startup companies that are doing flow batteries, um, first you have to do a great deal of sorting. So you have to sort by some kind of category, some kind of taxonomy. So I spend a lot of time generally trying to get my first list of companies. I'm looking at a specific field. Let's say I'm looking at flow batteries. I may end up starting with a search engine that gives me 2,000 hits. Um, generally, uh, I, can, I can delimiter that down to a couple hundred just by saying, 
companies that are in a certain stage don't really don't really meet my criteria. Something some companies that are past the stage where I can help them don't meet my criteria, uh, and some companies are out of business. But you know the search engines haven't figured that out yet. So I can get that down to a couple hundred relatively easily. And then from 200 down to the yield, our yield is about, uh, takes uh, two to 400 to get four. So it's about a 1% yield. So those 200, I and one of my colleagues go through company by company. We look them up, we call them, we email them, we download their patents. We read everything that's known about them in the public domain. Uh, the search engines that we use also have non-public domain information in them. And it's just a manual labor sort using my personal experience and, and how I, the, the companies match up with the objective function that I have in my job here at Halliburton Labs. Um, so, and then, you know, to get it, we usually can get that down to, oh, 40 or 50. Or we do this every 120 days. We sort two to 4,000 companies every 120 days. We get it down to 40 plus or minus, and then a bigger committee of people looks at it more broadly. We get it down to 10 or 12, and then we actually have a pitch competition to get it down to three to four. So if I start with two to 4,000, we end up with four at the end. So the yield, the ultimate yield is really one in a thousand, but a lot of that's automated. It's just a kind of, it's an acumen thing. It's a background as an engineer, I really have to spend more time thinking like an engineer than I had when I was a CTO. You don't really think much about engineering problems, but I've rekindled that in my <laughs> in the deep dark recesses of my brain. And um, so, if you're, I mean, you could do this too. You have to have these specific search engines, but it's just frankly a manual process, and it's exciting. It's like uh, you know you're looking for the needle in a haystack, and when you find it, some of these great companies. Um, because they're not jumping out at you. They're not advertising themselves. As I said, they're trying to survive and get their products to market where consumers will pay for them. And so they're not worried about telling the general population what they're doing. So it's really just a looking for that platinum needle in a really big haystack. Um, it's part of the excitement of the job. And occasionally um, it's a little bit nerve wracking because sometimes we get weeks and weeks without finding a company. And that's you know, you get discouraged. It's like going fishing. Some days you catch fish and some days you don't catch fish. But it's fun. It's fun. So on that on that note, along with companies, um, are there any companies um, within this arena that you feel we should keep our eyes on or any leaders um, in general? And then the, the, the tag along with that would be what, you know, what are they doing different that makes them stand out in, in your mind? Yeah. Well, I mentioned a couple of them here. I think for the architects, you should start to take a look at what's happening with this company, Nanotech. Um, I think their, their website is called thenanoshield.com uh, because they, I think what's unusual here is um, this is a team that puts together all the kinds of elements that make for potential very successful startup companies they have a fantastic idea, which is necessary, but insufficient. And then they have a team that's driven like the wind. They eat and sleep. They use their houses. They used to use their houses as chemical factory to make this stuff. I'm sure their houses don't look very good right now, but they've moved into where I work. They moved into Halliburton Labs and now they're making material at a scale that they really had dreamed to get to. And so I think you'll start to see these product, products like this from Nanotech you'll start to see companies like Momentum uh, Technologies, which is that lithium recycler. If you look in the popular news, the other company in lithium recycling I mentioned was Lycycle. Um, they recently spacked, so they went, they, they really haven't made much product yet, but they just sold themselves in the market for $1.5 billion. But what, what's distinguishing about these companies is that they may not necessarily come from the incumbent industry, but they are certainly uh, interested in disrupting the current industry because they believe there's a better way to do the things that they're doing. And so the companies like Momentum and Lifecycle basically said, 
we're not doing smelting. So, you know, smelting batteries is really dirty, messy business. And they have this fantastic approach. They got the intellectual property. They're smart enough to figure out how to use it. And so those kinds of companies are popping out. Do a, if you just do a Google search of what are the 10 most exciting energy startup companies, you're going to get all kinds of surprises of names of companies you never heard of. And they'll pop out at you and take a look at them and see what they're doing. It, it's remarkable minds with an incredible desire to make the world change. And those kinds of people, uh, they're not everywhere, but they're actually, because the world's such a big place, there's a lot of them, tens of thousands of people uh, trying to move the needle on this issue. Wow. You had, um, you had mentioned uh, momentum in terms of recycling lithium, and we have a question about lithium recycling in terms of how cost effective can it be or will it be like plastic recycling where it's cheaper to make plastic from new? Um, yeah, I think, well, that's, that's a to be determined question because nobody has scaled up to full scale and has commercial operations of chemical lithium recycling. There are smelters out there. Some of those other companies I mentioned are partly chemical and partly uh, smelting based. Um, so the costs aren't known. The thing, the risk that scale ups take is they believe it's going to be cheaper and on paper and in a laboratory, um, you never can really figure out what it costs when you build an industrial factory. And so they're in the process of building their pilot plants, their next big scale to find that out. I actually believe that chemical recycling, just on the basis of, of the following, you know, uh, smelting is, you know, melt the battery, burn the battery. You have to melt the metal and burn off all the plastic and the junk and the other things. And um, making metals like lithium go from a solid state to a liquid state, that's the smelting process. And then back to the solid state again, those are very energy intensive processes. It's, it's like melting an ice cube so you can make another ice cube. I mean, that takes a lot of energy. Dissolving things is actually a different thermodynamic process. And I think fundamentally, it's going to ultimately be cheaper to dissolve the metals into ions and recollect them as a pure stream of ions to reconstitute into the metals than it will be to do all this phase change with melting because uh, making ions through acid dissolution isn't, isn't the same as the kind of phase change that um, is energetically expensive with smelting. Um, we have another question on lithium in particular. What percentage by mass is a lithium battery actually lithium? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I'm not sure. It's not as much as you think. There, there's an awful lot of other constituents in it that include cobalt and copper and some other, you know, sort of rare, earth, so-called rare earth metals. There's carbon and then there's membranes and little things, I, you know, I don't know. I'd have to hazard a wild guess, but it's not the, it, it's, you know, it's not 95%. It's not the dominant feature, but the, but lithium has stands the opportunity to become so expensive that you're going to want to reclaim it. Um, just like um, the notion of gold, you know, there's an awful lot of gold that's thrown into landfills in electronics in cell phones. And it's, widely believed now that the concentration of gold in landfills is higher than the concentration of gold in gold bearing ore. Now, lithium is not that way just yet, but as we start using more and putting more lithium in service, it could be that, you know, if you just keep putting lithium into landfills, it, it, it's, there's going to be more lithium in landfills than there is in lithium mines. And so, you know, I think you could foresee that these guys have foreseen that that's going to happen and the public opinion is not going to allow these lithium lakes and these open pit mines to persist for forever so that uh, you know something has to be done about it. you saw those headlines those are from prestigious engineering journals and um, the, the tide is turning it's just simply uh, regardless of the percentage there's not going to be enough lithium if we keep using it one time and throwing it out. Um, 
So you, in, in terms of just the tide turning, you know, we, we certainly hear an awful lot about, you know, the, the future, the, the global future. Um, and one of our questions here is what is, and, and this is, I'll be really curious to see what you have to say about this, but what is a realistic outlook for 50 years down the road in terms of energy usage and conservation? 50 years, wow. I don't know if I can extrapolate 50 years. That would be, uh, chances are I'm not gonna get a chance to look back on this answer. Um, and, and that's okay too. Um, look, I think the, the, the mix is, is sure to shift. Right now we have uh, nuclear and oil accounting for 80-ish percent. Um, there will probably be some point where I don't think there's gonna be a tipping point where there's probably no hydrocarbons used because it's a really tough cost hurdle to get past. But the other thing that's happening in real time, which I didn't talk about today, is that people are working very hard to make uh, carbon using processes like hydrocarbons to become as carbon neutral as possible. So if you collected all the CO2 out of a gas fired power plant um, and you recycled that back into the ground by carbon sequestration or you used it for carbon flooding, um, you know, how much of an issue is that? So, you know, that ultimate balance is, is going to be hard to tell for sure. There's going to be great inroads made. Um, intermittence and hydrogen are not going to really be able to take the lion's share unless a couple of these really profound problems get solved. And those two problems are um, for electricity, so intermittent electricity making, the storage problem. That's why I focused on storage at the grid level. You can put a Tesla wall in your house and store enough for your house overnight, but we really need to be able to store enough energy for Houston or Pittsburgh for a week. That's a huge amount of energy. So that's going to be an important thing that because today's systems of hydrocarbon energy generation don't suffer from that intermittency. So that storage will need to be overcome and people are really working on it, as you saw. And then with, for example, a hydrogen economy, um, I talked about making hydrogen and using hydrogen. So make hydrogen by electrolysis, use hydrogen by a fuel cell. Um, but the real trick is how do you get hydrogen from where you make it to where you use it? Hydrogen is very hard to pump in uh, pipelines because it escapes. It's an escape artist. It diffuses through carbon steel. It goes out of every little nook and cranny that's in a flange of a pipeline, which methane can't get through. Remember, hydrogen is the smallest uh, molecule. So it, it gets places you don't want it to get, meaning it's an escape artist. And so the, the there's a big problem in moving hydrogen. How do you do it? Now you can compress it and put it in cylinders. You can liquefy it, but those are so energy intensive. Those are the factors that make hydrogen as a comparison to gasoline, uh, put them up in that 12 fold factor of expense. And those are thermodynamic limitations, which are just not gonna be able to be overcome. So there, there are new ways that people are thinking about uh, moving hydrogen by making it into a solid. There's, I wasn't gonna talk about it today, but there are, there are molecules called hydrides, metal hydrides, and you can take hydrogen as a gas, react it with a metal like manganese or aluminum and make a solid out. And then it's relatively benign, it's easy to transport, it's high energy density. Um, those processes are being developed and just now being scaled up for the very first time. So that, that's an important loop to close. Each of these energy modalities has a major flaw that has to be closed before, over the next 50 years, before all those new modes of energy making can be uh, replacements for hydrocarbons. And some of that's gonna be driven by taxes by public sentiment and some of it's going to be driven by gee if we can make money doing this let's do it and do it faster but 50 years mm, i you know i think a huge amount of motion can occur in 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 50 years but when people make these promises by 2030 which is only nine a little almost eight and a half years away um we're, we're not having a full transition by 2030.
Um, one last question, and then we're going to be wrapping it up. Have you uh, seen any on-demand hydrogen systems? Uh, do you mean by, do you mean manufacturing? Yeah. Or uh, yeah. So I mean, um, the the so the issue with making hydrogen on demand is um, you can do it by electrolysis. There are companies that that are trying to figure out how to do that the most energetically efficient, uh, but on demand, and, and you can ramp a hydrogen electrolysis up pretty fast, um, but it's not likely to be something that's really at your home. And the only reason for that is the equipment for it is pretty expensive. So you have to distribute the cost of that over a larger number of people. And the, the whole economies of scale thing is very important for hydrogen electrolysis. So on demand could be good. It's fine if you had, uh, if there was hydrogen distribution system, you could get hydrogen to that miraculous fuel cell thing at your house. Um, then the, the uh, utility companies could make it more or less on demand. But right now, there, there, there's no need for the demand because there is, there's no consumer demand for hydrogen basically anywhere in the world. It's all driven by the chemical industry. All right, well, well thank, thank you everyone for your questions. I'm gonna pass it over to, um, to Doug right now and he's gonna, he's gonna close our presentation out here today. Great, that was great. That was absolutely fantastic. And thank you so much for giving us a little bit of your insight today into what the future of our energy economy holds. I mean, as architects, we oftentimes you know, struggle to see what that future is over the hill. And it's interesting to see that you already are kind of peeking over the top of it and seeing what's out there and what new new uh, innovations and technologies are beginning to emerge. I can only imagine what 25 years is going to look like. You know, think about where we were all 25 years ago. We were still using fax machines and rotary dial phones. So, <laughs> so anyway. Hey, thank you so much, and I want to thank everybody for joining us today. I hope you got something out of today's discussion, um, and be sure to look out for our uh, invitation to you for next month's speaker series. Um, so we really appreciate it, and thank you very much. Thank you so much, Greg. Thank you. It's been my great pleasure. Thank you very much for having me.